We basically learn as children how to negotiate relationships. If you saw the movie Memento, it's a nice illustration of what happens when you lose that capacity. And you have to learn about relationships with each new relationship. Think of the capacity for transference that most religions hijack. Transferences to parents, to good mothers, good fathers, angry fathers, angry mothers. The capacity for transference. And you can start to see how these various discrete mechanisms come together in religious ideas and also in our capacities to generate religious beliefs. Now, religions, one of their functions seems to be to solve existential problems. And one of the existential problems historically that they've been very powerful at solving is what is called the problem of dead bodies. This is a Taliban commander who was killed. I mean, he looks sort of asleep. And when we are confronted by a dead body, it creates a conflict with us. We have in our minds something called theory of mind modules, theory of mind mechanisms. And these start to come online when we are about four or five years of age. All of you in this room basically know that I have a mind somewhat like yours with beliefs, intentions, desires, memories. You can't see my brain or my mind, but you operate quite seamlessly with the idea that I may hold ideas or knowledge different from you. And you particularly watch my eyes. You can read, you don't know it, you can read 212 different emotions about my intentions just from my gaze alone. Now, there's a problem here in that that theory of mind mechanism is always turned on. So when you're confronted with a dead body and you look at, you know, we look at that guy, you know, our theory of mind mechanisms are still on. But we have another capacity that evolved in our cognitive mechanisms called natural kinds modules. We know what's living and what's dead. We take it for granted, but you instantly know in an animal whether it's alive or dead. Almost instantly. So you've got a dead body, but you've got an active mind. That creates a conflict. And any of you who've gone through grief have felt it most acutely, particularly in the time after the death. Because you, on one hand, know the person is dead, but on the other hand, you're still talking to them. They're still alive in your mind. And you're trying to talk to them. And you can see how religions very easily solve this problem by just elevating that theory of mind just one step further into the idea of souls. So the body is gone, but the soul is alive. We have what are called hyperactive agency detectors. That's a fancy word for the following. If we're sitting here and we suddenly hear an explosion, all of us will jump. We will assume that that explosion was caused by humans until proven otherwise. That there's agency or intention behind it. That's why we will all mistake a shadow for a burglar long before we will ever mistake a burglar for a shadow. And most of the time these are just quiet, but those are always there. And we are very vulnerable to constantly look for and read intention or agency. This is what the causal determinants means. If I show you a computer screen and a ball slowly moves up a hill and a red triangle comes up behind it and, quote, pushes it up, you will see that triangle. You'll answer questions as if that triangle is trying to push that ball up, is being helpful. Or if the triangle keeps the ball from going up the hill, you'll say it's a bad triangle trying to push it down. You know, we're very quick. We're very quick to assume agency, and particularly human agency. We have something called intuitive reasoning. Basically, we fill in the blanks. When we don't have knowledge, we fill in the blanks. When all of you look at this, you see a line for that square along here. You see it with your edge detectors, but it's not there. You'll fill it in. And so we constantly are filling in things 
And the default position is, of course, to fill it in with human agency. Uh, we have what's called motivated reasoning. Uh, we doubt what we don't want to hear. Uh, and again, all of these are cognitive mechanisms that had utility in the environments that we evolved in. Okay? You, know, you, you don't want to change beliefs easily because it may put you at odds with the group, and the group is you know, crucial to your survival. You know, when we're ostracized from a group now, it's painful. Historically, we're ostracized from a group, you're dead. Uh, confirmation bias. Uh, we tend to notice data that confirms our beliefs and the same sort of things. Helps group cohesion. Um, mere familiarity. Um, we are going to go with what's familiar tradition before we do something else. Uh, and again, constantly think about the environment in which we evolved in and these cognitive mechanisms, particularly in the social environments that uh, we were you know, faced with. Uh, what Dan Dennett calls belief and belief. There's a bias towards belief. Uh, we have very fast mechanisms. One of the human frailties we have is that we perceive, we believe, then we may or may not question the evidence. Okay? And that gets us in a lot of trouble. But historically, that would be very good. If John told me that there's a tiger behind the tree, um, I'm not going to say, well, John, what's the evidence? Why do you think the tiger's there? He tells me a tiger's behind the tree. I best believe it and out of here. Okay? Okay? And you can see historically how that would be very useful, but that kind of mechanism is, is uh, something that no longer has utility. Okay? Um, this is what, uh, and that piece of evidence we see today is why you may wonder why the Republicans are hounding on Obama being a terrorist. Okay? Because if we hear that long enough, okay, in our minds somewhere, we're going to start doubting. Hmm, well, maybe the guy, you know, Muslim name. Mm -hmm. you know, and and that's, that's what happens. Um, but again, in environments, historical and ancestral environments, these things were probably adapted. Okay. Uh, many of you have heard about mirror neurons. Uh, what's that? Okay. If I raise my right hand, while you all are sitting here watching it, okay, the same part of your brain, left motor cortex, will light up um, when you raise that that lights up when you raise your right hand. I raise my right hand. Every left cortex here is lighting up even though your right hand is not going up. Okay? If I put a nail in my hand, if I were to stand here and put a nail in my hand, you know, parts of my right thalamus are going to light up. Okay? But if I put a nail in my left hand, parts of your right thalamus are going to light up too. You will literally feel my pain. Okay. Why is this um, relevant? Well, the um, uh, Christian religion takes advantage of this. Um, this is a Filipino devotee who in 2007 had himself nailed to a cross. Okay. Um, and when you look at that, right here, this right hand's getting nailed. Left thalamus, the pain areas in your brain are lighting up right now. Okay. And of course, when you see such pictures, at some level, that kind of, you know, the kind of pain you, you don't even have to consciously think about it. Unconsciously, the kind of pain you think this individual is experiencing, you're starting to experience at some level. Okay. So our empathic quality, our empathic capacities, which you can see, would be, you know, cognitively uh, tremendous adaptations for social group living. You know, you help each other in pain. Okay. You can see how this is, you know, hijacked. And if it combines with other things, like the gentleman on the cross died for your mistakes, your sins, you know, and he suffered, you felt it, you can see how you can get drawn in, you know, fairly easily. Okay. <clears throat> Another thing that religions use are what are called hard to fake costly signals of uh, commitment. If I tell you I'm committed to something, why would you believe me? You know that I can deceive you, okay? So how do I override your reasonable doubt about my capacity to deceive you? 